we, we had to have a token security talk, right? We had to have a token founder, and Kevin crushed it. So we went out looking for security keynotes, and we, we got nothing short of the best of the bunch. Um, this guy, Hugh Thompson, has uh, literally given a talk at every testing and security conference on the planet. Okay, we should be good. And, um, and he's, he's nailed them all. Uh, in fact, for four years, I held the record at STAR. Maybe you all, some of you all have been to STAR uh, for the best presentation of all time, right? One, number one. And he was the one that knocked me from my podium uh, a few years ago. So uh, I, I have a lot of reasons not to like this guy. I have a lot of reasons to like this guy as well, because at one point he was my student uh, many, many years ago. And then years later, I turn on the TV and I'm watching MSNBC and Lou Dobbs is uh, giving his show. And all of a sudden, this guy walks onto Lou Dobbs' show and gets interviewed by Lou Dobbs about some virus or something nasty that, that happened uh, to the world. So um, the display is, try it again. <laughs> yeah, A Windows it. user. Man, yeah. Well, that is the old joke, right? A, a, there's an electrical engineer, a mechanical engineer, and a software engineer in a car. The car breaks down. The mechanical, mechanical engineer gets out and starts checking hoses and stuff. And the know, electrical engineer gets out and checks the battery. And the software engineer rolls down all the windows and rolls them back up again. That's the one that does it. Okay, so, um, and then he, uh, Hugh also is the program chair of the, I, I, this might even be one of the largest technical conferences in the world, the RSA show that is, uh, is it still in San Francisco? Or did yeah, it grow yeah, the yeah still Center? there, man. Uh, 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 and so, um, so I'm really pleased uh, that Hugh is here to join us, and I won't introduce him any longer now that the equipment's working. Hugh Thompson. Thanks for that uh, introduction. I think, I think, man, I haven't I think quite work. known whether to thank you yet or not for that. Um, but it's a real pleasure to be here at GTAC. Thanks, James, so much for inviting me to come. You know, it's great to be able to talk to the testing community. Um, and I know this is the token security talk, but I'll, uh, I'll do my best to uh, represent our uh, uh, kind of community of no, which is what the security community is usually uh, known as, but I'll, I'll, uh, I'll try to represent us well. So this is a talk really about risk. So when you add a feature to a piece of software, to a hardware system, you get utility, but utility trades off with risk in a very, very interesting way. So this is really a talk about looking at the features that you add and trying to understand the risks that come from them. And how's a bad guy going to look at this thing? So not how the user's going to interact with it and how much they love it and enjoy it and the great things that they're going to say on their blog or their Twitter feed, but how is an attacker going to view it? And to uh, set the stage, I want to share a personal security story with you. So I'm uh, from Nassau, Bahamas. I don't know if anybody's ever been there. Beautiful vacation spot, if you uh, haven't. Uh, we need your tourist dollars, so even though it's a down economy, consider us. And there's uh, been two key events in Bahamian history, at least from my perspective. The first was our independence from the British in 1973, which I'm sure uh, you guys can relate to. I know there's actually some applause for that, which is a little troubling. And then um, the second, which was just as important to me personally, was the introduction of soda machines into high schools. Dude, this was like a pivotal event in Bahamian history. And you know, we'd already, we'd always seen soda machines on pirated reruns of Beverly Hills 90210, that kind of stuff. And you know, when the government announced that they were buying a bunch of them, everybody was really excited. So anyway, this is about three weeks after they installed the first soda machines, me and two other guys are kind of hanging around one, and one of the guys was my best friend all through high school who later became a priest, which may be relevant shortly. 
The second guy, though, I'm just going to say it up front, we did not know him very well. So I just wanted to throw that out there early. It's not a friend, it's just a guy we just kind of, you know, casually knew. So we're standing around this thing, and it's got a big handwritten sign on it that says U.S. Quarters Only. Now, to give you a little background, the Bahamas has its own currency, the Bahamian dollar, that's artificially pegged one-to-one -one with the U.S. dollar, which was a good idea until a couple of years ago. And uh, the way things work over there is if you buy something in U.S. or Bahamian, you'll get mixed change. So you can use either currency interchangeably. Now, the government had purchased these machines very cheap from the U.S., so they'd only take U.S. quarters. And none of us had a U.S. quarter. And so we asked a question that any of you would naturally ask in that kind of circumstance. What else can we put into this machine to force it to give us a soda? <laughs> now, we tried legitimate things at the beginning. You know, we put a Bahamian quarter in, no dice, that, that didn't work. Uh, we tried a, a U.S. nickel even, kind of didn't register. And so then we essentially started to fuzz it, like a guy, you know, prod a washer off of a chair, threw that in, nothing was happening. Another guy tried a pencil, but there was a user interface problem there, that didn't work out very well. Uh, another guy tried salt water, but it turns out that was just messy, so that, uh, that didn't cut it. And eventually we got down to using a Bahamian 10 cent piece. Now if you've never seen one of these, they're kind of interesting. They're corrugated around the side, so it sort of looks nothing like a U.S. quarter. But when we drop this thing in, the machine instantly registers 25 cents. Now, we are understandably pretty excited about this. You know, it's a, a pretty substantial discount on the sodas. So we look for as many 10 cent pieces we could find, right? So we put another one in, it says 50 cents, another one in, 75 cents, a last one in, it says a buck, I hit the button, and we get a soda. And, you know, so we got uh, 13, 14 sodas. And then on the 15th soda, when we went to hit the button, the unthinkable happened. Like, worst case scenario for us, the red light comes on. So this thing's out of sodas, right? Now, not, not willing to take a loss on our 15th soda, we hit the coin return button. <laughs> now... Given the wording, you would expect coin return to mean we have just given this machine some coins and now it will return those coins from whence they came kind of thing. Uh, it turns out though how it was implemented as a feature, then it takes coins from the bottom of the machine, slightly more mechanically efficient than taking the coins you just put in. So we hit coin return and we get one US dollar worth of coins. So now at this point, the three of us react very differently. So, <laughs> personally, you know, I'm all for discount sodas, but I'm like, dude, now we're into money laundering, right? So I followed, <laughs> I followed what's known as the responsible disclosure uh, method, and I, I said, dude, you know, we, we just got to tell the principal, right? This is what you do when you find something really bad. You go and tell the company, hey, look, you know, something. Okay, so that, at least that's the way the story goes. So the second guy, who later turned out to be the priest, you know, I, I said might be relevant, uh, this guy was more of a gregarious kind of fellow, and he took the full disclosure model. So he's like, man, we got to tell all our friends, right? So, you know, that's, that's reasonable. I thought that was, that was reasonable. And then the third guy, again, I just want to emphasize, he was not a friend, not a close associate. I don't know where he is now. This guy followed a very interesting model that's now known as non-disclosure. He said, and, and he was uh, very forceful, so we listened to him for a while, but he said, don't tell anybody. We're going to make us some money, All right? So again, it was a very convincing argument at the time. So the next day, I see this guy walking up the driveway to school, and he's jingling like an ice cream truck, you know, just loaded with these tents. So he wiped out that machine. The guy who wasn't supposed to tell anybody told his cousin at another school. It escalated into this issue that became known as Sodagate. And not, not a lot happens in the Bahamas. It's easy to, to make the papers. 
But let's look at this from a vulnerability perspective. What went wrong? When the machine measured and asked the question, is this a US quarter, it did it in two ways. It looked first at diameter of the coin. Right? So it took the diameter of the coin, measured it with some type of caliper, and then it looked at the weight of the coin. And it turned out, just as a matter of coincidence, if you measure a Bahamian 10 cent piece, the size is almost equal. If you measure the weight, again, almost equal, indiscernible by the equipment that they were using. Now think about this feature, because this is a choice of how they decided to implement it. Think about this from a risk perspective. When they built this machine, they built it in the context of the US, right? That was their deployment model. We're going to sell these things within the US. When they did that, I'm sure they probably went to Home Depot or whatever thing like that existed back then and bought any round thing that they could buy that cost less than a quarter and throw it in. And, and that was their testing, right? If it, dude, if it costs more than a quarter, why would we care? Cost less than a quarter, it's kind of an interesting case. But they had this assumption in mind, but didn't track that assumption through the lifespan of the product. Right? So it seemed like a good idea at the time, but now they're selling into a different market. It's going into a country where every single user in their pocket has a weapon that they could use against this thing. A very, very different risk model. So I want you to keep this soda machine in the back of your mind, because we're going to refer to it again a little bit later. Because I think it gets to the heart of where security problems are today. We still got buffer overflows. We still have SQL injection problems. Cross-site scripting is still a big issue. But more than that, we're getting into this very interesting place where we built a set of assumptions around features and who will use those features and how they will use them. And attackers are starting to use those against us. But before I go there, I wanted to make a quick public service announcement because this is, as I mentioned, uh, talk about assessing risk. And the, uh, the announcement is there is a current shark crisis that I've labeled Shark Mageddon. I don't know if anybody's been following this, but a report came out earlier this year that said the number of worldwide shark attacks is up 25%. Dude, 25% increase? That's crazy. You know, I said I was from the Bahamas. You know, I'm, I'm looking at this and I. At any one time, I probably have four family members in the ocean. You know, do I call somebody? Do I have a cousin blow a coconut? You know, how, 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 how uh, or a conch shell? You know, how big an issue is this thing? Um, so I, I decided to investigate further. MSNBC, front page story. Shark attacks rose by 25% across the globe. And look at this very scary picture of a shark, which emphasizes the problem. Los Angeles Times, US led the world in shark attacks last year. Again, panic, serious concern. Now, let's take a look behind the numbers that got us to this uh, point of panic earlier this year. The number of shark attacks <laughs> worldwide went from 63 to 79. Yes, that is a 25% Increase, I will give you that. But the chances of you personally getting attacked by a shark are like minuscule. Like the chances of you getting maimed by a coconut and then like some kind of rabid squirrel attacking you and in combination are much greater than you actually getting attacked by a shark. And I think for that reason, we're in a really interesting state in risk management. We either don't assess risk at all, or when we assess it, we assess it on very bad or incomplete data. So we're going to go back to that in a second. Oh, yeah, actually, much of the increase was due to two very angry sharks. I thought that was kind of interesting, that one shark can make a difference. <laughs> if, you, if you take nothing else away, no, OK, never mind. Um, now, this is a, another interesting risk case. Here was a fellow who was on vacation, didn't realize he was taking a risk, but took a photo at, one might say, an unfortunate angle. Right? <laughs> Somebody put it online, 
and labeled this guy the Thumb Man because of his striking, <laughs> striking resemblance to a human thumb, right? You know, it's very, very interesting. Again, you know, very poor risk assessment, didn't quite understand, you know, what was going to happen. But I want you to consider this Thumb Man for a moment because he is going to be kind of our inspiration for the rest of the talk, I, I feel. Because the Thumb Man was not defeated by this incident. In fact, the Thumb Man owned his thumb likeness and created ThumbMan.net. <laughs> he went Web 2.0, entrepreneurial, you know, I'm going to deploy. He started <clears throat> selling Thumb Man merchandise. I own a Thumb Man t-shirt. So, it, and, and I have a discount code. If anybody's interested later, come and see me after the talk. But there, he overcame this kind of unfortunate risk choice and turned it into an advantage. And I think that that's what we can do today with some of the risk choices that we're making, particularly around sharing data. And I'm going to get into some very specific examples of that. Risk is... Uh, is a really tricky thing. So we looked at the case of the sharks where we think we're assessing risk, but we're actually assessing it very inappropriately and messaging it very inappropriately. This happens often in the security space. We rely on fear, uncertainty, and doubt often to convince somebody that you should do something from a security perspective. If we don't rely on fear, uncertainty, and doubt, we tend to go back and rely on some set of data which is grossly incomplete and truly misrepresents what the real risk is. So I'm going to talk a little bit about how we may be able to get to better risk assessments. And I think the biggest problem with security is that it's difficult to measure what you prevented, even retrospectively. So I, I, you know, I talked to my mom last night. James knows my mom. You know, we probably talked to her every, uh, oh, you got thumbman.net? Dude, I got the discount code, man. Don't buy it without the discount code. You're, you're only hurting yourself. So um, every time I talk to my mom, when we end the call, she says, son, did you take your vitamins? And last night she said, son, did you pack your vitamins, which I guess is a small variation on that. And she's never built for me the right business case to convince me to take my vitamins. Because look, I take the vitamins, and sometimes I still get sick. I don't take the vitamins, and sometimes I still get sick. It's very difficult for me to quantify how much benefit that prevention gave me. So we're going to look at some methods, I think, that may help to give some more clarity around that. But before we get there, I want to share uh, another story with you. I think this is before I met you, James, and before I met uh, Ibrahim, who's speaking tomorrow, Rusi, who was here earlier. Um, it's, it was definitely during a misspent period in my college career. I was really young. Everybody kind of makes um, some unfortunate choices during those times. And for me, you know, I hang, hung out in kind of a, a sort of geeky crowd, and I say that with pride. Uh, and it was a very important time, I think, in the formation of technology uh, because it was when the world's first talking Barney doll was introduced to the market. Now, we had seen this talking Barney doll, and we had uh, heard that some people had gone out and were able to uh, actually reprogram the EEPROM that it was uh, sort of based off of. So we went to the toy store, we bought one of these Barneys, and we played around with it for probably eight hours or so, and had it say key phrases from Star Trek. So instead of like the classic, I love you, you're great, you know, your mom's so cool, that kind of stuff, it would say things like, damn it, Jim, I'm a doctor, not a miracle worker, right? And, and uh, we had it say some really inappropriate things like, uh, I think your mom has a knife, like that kind of stuff. But I didn't sanction that at all. That was the other guys. And so then, you know, we're playing around with this thing for a while, and that was kind of entertaining. And then somebody in the group says, dude, let's return it back to the store, and then kind of like watch people interact. And I'm like, no way, we're not going to do it, absolutely not. So four hours later, we returned it. And, 
and you know, watch people, and then, and then I, you know, we felt really bad about it, so we bought it back. One of them still has it, actually. But uh, I keep that Barney in mind for a second, because what it got the group thinking about is who do you trust? And I'll, I'll get back to that in one second. So you got the Barney. Now it's two weeks later, same group of guys. And we used to get together every Saturday and play a game called Whist. I don't know if anybody's ever heard of Whist, even. It's like uh, very similar to Bridge. So it's a partner game where you're playing against two other folks. And this other team had just been crushing us for the last probably month and a half, and I knew they weren't that good. And so finally we accused them of cheating. Like, dude, you guys are cheating. These deck is marked. And they said, look, next week what we'll do, we're going to go together and buy the card deck together as a group from 7-Eleven, which was right on the corner, a trusted uh, third-party authority, unless you're getting a hot dog. But other than that, a generally trusted third. So we went together, we bought the deck, we played the game, and again, our team got completely crushed. And later, they felt guilty and sort of told us what they did. And what they'd done is the day before, they went to 7-Eleven, they bought all the card decks, they marked them, and returned them back to the store, inspired by our Barney incident. Now, I, I bring that story up because there was an interesting trust relationship there, right, that was inappropriate. We trusted 7-Eleven as a third party. We truly thought that that was an unbiased third party that didn't have any sort of skin in the game favoring us or anybody else. And what's interesting about that is that today users make very interesting trust assumptions that are inappropriate. So I teach the software security class at Columbia University, and uh, we always had the students do very interesting projects. So this year, we made up a term, and this was right around January, called context reflux. So you may have never heard of this term because it totally doesn't exist, but we made the definition of it to be the cost of context switching. So if you're moving from one task to another, that cost of changing is context reflux, or at least that's our uh, BS definition of it. So I asked them to, quote, seed it into the internet. All right? So one guy puts it on his blog, another guy creates a Wikipedia entry, a third guy creates like a horrible one-slide YouTube video about context reflux. And within a couple of days, we had the first two pages of Google search, right? Previously non-existent term, and now it has a definition, right? And the definitions are all consistent. So then, probably, I'd say a month later, we had this RSA conference, and for the closing keynote, one of the things that we did was get up in front of the crowd, and I don't know, maybe there's 10,000 people there or so, and played a game of Balderdash. I don't know if anybody's ever played that game. It's where one person has a legitimate definition of a term, and the other people have fake definitions, and they're trying to sell you on the fact that their definition is correct. So there's not really a definition of this thing, so I went up and kind of sold people on my definition, which is the one that's out here on the net. And I had a buddy go out and try and vigorously sell. There was some kind of gastrointestinal thing. I can't even remember exactly, which makes sense because reflux related. But, um, and it was fascinating. You could see people in the crowd, first thing they do, pull out their phone, type it in to search, and go and see what Google says. Right? There's a trust relationship there. And this is how you choose to optimize sites. And it's not wrong. It's just a natural function of taking data and presenting it to the user. But I'll tell you how attackers see this, which is very interesting. The spam and phishing email I'm starting to get says, for security reasons, we are not including a link. Right? And that feeds into the type of security awareness training that they're getting inside of big companies. Look, if you get a link, don't click on it. It could be really dangerous. So the email says and confronts that and says, look, we're not including a link. So instead of a link, what, we're, what we want you to do is we want you to go and we want you to search for this term and find our website. It'll come right up. And then go there and download whatever tool you need to download. 
Very, very interesting. So they're laundering trust through a third party. And I, I want you to think about that for a little bit, because I think that's where the future of attackers are heading. They're looking for vulnerabilities in trust relationships, things that people are inappropriately looking at one way when they actually mean something else. So what was really cool, and this we don't have it anymore, but we also own Suggest. So if you typed in context, our reflux was the first thing, but it isn't anymore. I forgot what beat us out, but we, I'll uh, check it after this. And so with this in mind, I want to introduce this concept of gateway data. Because the internet now is all about data. The data that people choose to volunteer, the data that others volunteer about us, and really the data that institutions have about us that are now becoming searchable. I don't know if anybody here has an Ancestry.com account, but it's incredible to see the kind of data, the biographical data, that you can now mine, search, categorize, and find out what you can really find out about a person um, over time and their family and their history. And that's a really interesting thing. So gateway data is data that seems harmless. It's the name of your pet. It's your, the fact that it's your cousin Sal's birthday. But when used properly, can facilitate access to highly sensitive information. So I think there's three types of this gateway data. One is direct use. So this is data that's convertible directly into access. A password, for example, is convertible directly to access. It fails a definition because it's something that you hold close. But for many people, the name of the place they went to high school actually gives access through password reset. Right? Very, very interesting. So that's direct use gateway data. I'll talk about the other two in a second. But on the topic of direct use, let's think about how this is used today. So think about standard password reset questions. Now, this is another one of these, like the Coke machine, something that was a good idea from a risk perspective a long time ago. And now the risk climate has changed. So think about this for a second. I'll, I'll tell you a quick story. Um, this was, I don't know, this was about three years ago. I was under a vicious deadline to get this privacy article out for scientific and I just hadn't written it yet, right? And now it's like closing into D-Day, and my wife tells me that she's having this dinner party, and it's with people I hardly know, and I'm like, man, I'm hoping my dentist is available for an appointment during that time, so I have something else to do. But instead, I thought, well, this would be a very interesting experimental group to do something with and then write the article based on. So as people came in, I asked them, would you mind with your permission and under your supervision, if we sit down together and I try and get into all your accounts online, not through hacking, through password reset. Uh, so a lot of people said no. There was one very vivid gesture that I can still kind of head if I close my eyes. It's very creative, actually. But a couple of people, a couple of people said yes. Yeah. So I did it with three folks. For two of them, within an hour. I was able to get into every account they cared about. So bank account, first place to start. What do they do? In many cases, they ask you to answer a biographical question, and then they send you a reset email. So they don't just let you reset your account. So then, next place you go is that email account. How do you know even where it got sent? You mine online and you look for any old resumes this person may have. What email is associated with it there? You look at other sources that may tell you, for example, their college email account. And depending on the school that you went to, that email account may still be valid. And it was fascinating to see because it turned out in those two cases and probably like 30 other times I've done it since then, that uh, un sanctioned, sanctioned. <laughs> for the rack, this is being recorded, okay. Um, that your identity online precariously rides on a set of biographical questions that's asked on your oldest email account. So think about the chain of trust, for example. Really interesting experiment to try on yourselves and your own account. How does your bank reset? 
probably sends it to an email account. How does that email account reset? We may send it to another email account. Eventually, you're going to get to an email account that doesn't know any other email accounts, and it's going to ask you some very simple questions. Questions like, what city were you born in? Questions like, what was your grandfather's occupation? I had a student this past semester do a comparison between the password reset questions of the top five free email providers and Ancestry.com, the stuff that you could find instantly on Ancestry. And there was a 30% overlap. Really, really interesting. So this choice, and it was a design choice, this choice of using biographical data to reset your password was like a good idea 20 years ago. Like, who knew this stuff except for your close friends and family? And they could do a lot worse stuff to you than reset your password. But now you are so knowable at a distance by somebody you've never met that it's no longer an inappropriate, it's no longer an appropriate risk choice for many people in many cases. Category number two, amplification gateway data. So here's where things get more interesting. Instead of something like talking about your cat Fluffy online that you can translate into access through password reset, you know, what's the name of your favorite pet? This is data that when you bounce it off a person will get you more sensitive information. Like for example, if somebody called you up on the phone and said, hey, you know, this is like your bank or something, right? Maybe they say it more eloquently. But right? can you, you know, for security reasons, can you tell me your social security number? I don't think many people would, unfortunately there are some people that would just give it automatically, but I don't think most people would do it. But what if the bank called and said, or the person pretending to be the bank called and said, hey look, this is your bank. For security reasons, I am going to give you the first five digits of your social security number, and I need for you to give me the last four. And that way, can I confirm to you that I'm your bank and you confirm to me that you're you? And it turns out that a lot of people will actually give it in that circumstance. Now, the first five digits of somebody's social security number is based on things like where they were born. There's some wonderful research by a guy named Alessandro Quisti at Carnegie Mellon. Uh, about two years ago, a uh, fascinating paper on how you could predict those numbers. But even forget about that for a second. If you have access to LaxisNexis, for example, you can get the first five digits of someone's social security number very, very easily. So it's really the last four that interesting things hinge on. Another very interesting thing about social security numbers is that they're being used in an authentication context where that was never the original intention of how those numbers should be used. When I went to college, my social security number was my student number. I wrote it everywhere. It was on all kinds of pieces of paper. I'd, I'd say for many of you that it's probably the same situation. Now, a social security number is sacrosanct. Right? You'd never do something like that with social security number because if you ever exposed it to anybody, now you fall prey to the breach notification laws. So it's really interesting if you take a piece of data that didn't used to be sensitive and you suddenly make it sensitive, we don't have a mechanism to do that today. Everything's sticky. Once it was not sensitive and now it is, uh, it's not a tenable sort of situation. Here's another interesting example. So the way that many banks authenticate to you that this is actual email from the bank is they put the last four digits of your account number in the email. How many people have gotten an email from their bank that does this, out of curiosity? Okay, I'd say about 40% of the crowd. So there was a, a really great researcher. Um, he said, PayPal now, who's at Indiana University at the time that he did it, Marcus Jacobson, that did a study where he sent a bunch of people these kinds of emails that had the legitimate last four digits, and then he sent another group of people the same email, but it had the first four digits of their credit card number. Almost no difference in between those two groups from a trust perspective. But those numbers actually represent very, very different things from a sender's perspective. 
the first four digits of somebody's credit card number are basically public. They just say what issuer issued the credit card number. So if you've got a Discover card, it's like the same for everybody. Right? If you've got a Visa or MasterCard, it depends on the issuing bank. So this, again, is a type of data that when you bounce it off a person, is interpreted as a higher level of trust than it's truly meant to be. Now the third category, uh, I think, is the one that's going to plague us in the future. It's collective intelligence gateway data. So it's data that seems to be totally useless. Like even if you put it in the context of password reset, doesn't do anything really interesting. If you told it to somebody in an email, doesn't sound very interesting from a trust perspective. But when you take it and you cross-reference it with a bunch of other stuff about a group, you can tell really interesting things. Uh, there's a couple of types of data that fall into this category. One is location, where you are. Now, you know, most people don't think twice about telling somebody where they are. In fact, a lot of the tools that we use now regularly to update Twitter, for example, uh, include a geotag. When we take a picture by default, many of the phones, certainly my iPhone does, automatically encodes it. So I can find out where somebody is and where they've gone, and I don't think most people think that's a huge secret. But now think about this again through the lens of the attacker. And the attacker here may be a bad guy or they may be a competitor. What an attacker can do is look at the movement of groups. Like, for example, I would love to find out where the mergers and acquisitions team of HP, for example, has gone for the last month. That would be really fascinating. Or where has the sales force of my competitors been moving over the last month or the last couple of weeks? That's really interesting data. That's incredibly sensitive data to the company. But it's the kind of things now that it's just a matter of tooling to be able to aggregate. The data's out there. It's not a matter of the data not being out there. It's just a tooling question around aggregation. So here's a, a tweet that's not very interesting when you kind of look at it. Flying to Bentonville, Arkansas for a quick trip and meeting straight through the day. All right, let me ask you a question. If you're flying to Bentonville, Arkansas, for all-day meetings. Dude, who are you meeting with? Walmart! Who else is in Bentonville? Right, really interesting. So you've just told the world that you guys are courting Walmart, or maybe you already have a relationship with Walmart. That's really interesting, again, from a competitor standpoint. We're starting to see tools in the research community, the security community, good and bad, that are focused on mining big data and aggregating this data in really interesting ways. Uh, this was a cool project from a couple of years ago. You, many of you may remember this. PleaseRobMe.com. Does anybody remember this? Anybody ever go there? They called it a robbery opportunity portal. Right? So it kept track, based on the things that you tweet, are you away from home? That's all it cared about. Were you away from the home? And if you were, that's a fascinating piece of data to a physical burglar that may want to break into your home. Really, really interesting. There's another really cool project appropriately named called Creepy. I don't know if anybody's ever run into this one, but it, the name uh, really kind of lives up to it. Uh, it allows you to track this geolocation data over an extended period of time. We've seen some tools pop up in the attacker community, for example, that are mining personal tidbits of data and automatically integrating them into hyper-focused and hyper-personalized phishing attacks. Think about that, for example. right? If you started to get hyper-personalized phishing attacks, how vulnerable or not vulnerable do you think you personally are to that kind of threat? Think about the choices that you make when you see an email. You look at who sent it. I don't know how many people here routinely use uh, PGP, but it's nowhere near what we thought it would be 10 years ago. Right? So you make trust choices often just based on the content. 
And that's the problem with phishing emails now, is they're starting to get boring. Like, I miss the days when there's like a guy that has 10 million bucks and is willing to give me 2 million if I'll just help him get it out of the country. Those were great. Right? They were horribly spelled. You know, there's always money involved. You know, it's like wonderful times. Now, those same types of emails that we're starting to see from a company perspective are very tailored very personal, and they look just like the boring work emails that you routinely get. Really, really interesting. And they're built because of data that's publicly available. Related to this topic, the ability for people to make good choices about risk and security, I think was never great to begin with, but it's starting to erode because of the data that's out there. And I think we often create processes that expect too much of users. They expect users to make very fine-grained trust choices. This is an example. Uh, this, uh, I don't know if uh, anybody's been to New York recently, but you kind of live and die by the Metro card. Right? This is the thing that gets you into the subway. And they have interesting things on the back of them. You know, some have like a message. If you see something, say something, report a crime, that kind of stuff. Uh, one of them on the back has emergency instructions. So this is what to do if there's an emergency inside the subway. So it's a little blurry, so I'll read them. Number one, notify train crew or police if you see someone in distress or notice unlawful or suspicious behavior. That's pretty good. That's good, good, certainly a good thing to do. Number two, do not pull the emergency cord. Let me ask you a question. <laughs> If you are in the middle of an emergency in an enclosed subway, are you going to A, start reading instructions on the back of your card, or B, pull a huge cord that says emergency on it? Right? Very interesting, making some bad choices about what the user uh, can or can't do. Uh, this is another very interesting one. So a friend of mine recently uh, went to buy a purse at a very high-end store, and she finds one that's just perfect, right? Exactly what she wanted, but didn't have a price tag. So she figured it was something that somebody else probably had returned. You know, they didn't like it for whatever reason. So she went up to the counter to check out. You know, they look up the price. She buys the, the purse, or I think officially it's a wallet. And uh, she takes it back home, starts to transfer all her stuff over, and she opens it up and she finds something fascinating inside. This piece of paper with admin and server passwords written on it. So this is somebody who not only made the bad choice of writing their passwords down, but also put it in a purse that they then returned back to the store. Now, I, I bring this case up because it's an interesting one and one that we shouldn't be surprised about. In fact, it's one that we should expect of users. And you know, we do interesting things, and in the security space, we do it to ourselves all the time. We crank up a dial on security, forcing users to do even worse things than we were trying to prevent. For example, you know, hey, look, people are picking bad passwords. They're choosing password as their password, or they're choosing like their favorite bunny's name or something like that. So we want to deal with this problem. So what we're going to do is we're going to enact a 12-character password policy. It's got to have at least three special characters in it, one foreign language character, and it can't be similar to the last 78 passwords you just set, right? And this is going to be good. This is going to solve our password problem. Well, what happens when you crank up a dial like that in isolation? It's not psychologically acceptable to users. They're going to do things to work around it. They're going to write stuff down and put it in a purse. That's like natural. So I think it's really interesting when we start to think about the user's experience. So you know, my, my mom is just such a, a great sort of user case in general. So she, um, it's interesting to watch her online and then on her mobile phone. So online, if she gets to a site, for example, that says, hey, look, 
The thing you're about to do is really dangerous. You should definitely not do it. Like seriously, seriously don't do it. She's always going to hit OK, because she just wants to see what the psych does, right? <laughs> she doesn't even read the message. She just hits OK. And it's fascinating her, to see her install stuff on her Android phone. Right? Hey, here's an application. It wants to access your payment cards. It wants to check the security log. It wants to. Okay, she doesn't even look at it. All she wants to do is be able to shoot the bird towards the pig and get done. You know, whatever she needs to get done. And and what we're doing is we're outsourcing security choices, complex security choices to a user we know is not going to make good choices. That's crazy. When you think of that as an, from an ecosystem perspective, it's a good idea in isolation. We want to inform the user. We want to tell them what they're agreeing to. In practice, if you look at it in a macro group, that's like a really scary scenario. Because you know in practice, most users are going to make the bad choice. So the question. I guess I pose from a security perspective, is how are we going to help the user make better choices in general? And I think it's designing systems that are easy to use securely and difficult to use insecurely. Because historically, we've done the opposite. We've designed systems that are super easy for a person to use insecurely but very difficult for them to use in a secure way. In fact, they don't even think about that trade-off usually when they do something. Now, don't be deceived by this slide saying summary, because I still have quite a bit left to go. Um, I want to share with you another very interesting story. And this happened, I don't know, I guess this happened maybe about five years ago. And uh, I just the most amazing bug types of things happened to me on planes. I can tell you some other stories later. But this one was uh, about five years ago. You know, I, get, I sit on this plane. I'm sitting next to a guy. Um, and you know, I don't know how it happened, but like almost immediately, we get into this argument around whether Star Trek Deep Space Nine should have been included in the Star Trek family of television shows. And I was adamantly against Deep Space Nine. I mean, I really didn't like it. And he was a huge Deep Space Nine fan. And we kind of uh, we just locked heads on it. And then finally, we agreed to disagree. And then I asked him, uh, you know, what, what kind of business are you in? And he said, IT. And I'm like, I'm not surprised. So, so we started to talk a little bit more. And he'd been hired as an admin at a manufacturing company 10 years before this. So think about that. That's like 15 years ago. So he gets hired at this company. He does a quick assessment. And he realizes there's no backup and recovery disks for a critical system that's operating floor equipment. So he goes, first thing he does is creates a set of backup recovery disks. And back then, it was the old five and a quarter inch disk. I don't know if anybody even remembers those. But when floppy disks were really floppy, or when they even existed. Um, so he you know, builds a set of disks. There's 10 of them. He walks over to the secretary slash admin's office and says, hey, can you please label these disks and put them in the fireproof safe? It right? should have taken them off site, but that's fine. At least that's better than where they were. So she says, no problem. Six months later, something horrible happens. There was a power spike. The system goes down. He's got to take a secondary system and bring it online. So he goes to her office and says, hey, you know, can I get those recovery desks? She gives him the desk. She puts the first one in, and he sees the two scariest messages you could ever see as a system administrator. Media error. Right? So that disk is totally gone. He puts in the second disk. Media error. The whole stack is gone. Uh, so he spends the next three days, no sleep, rebuilding this thing from scratch. Finally, it's up and running. The machinery is working. He goes and he makes another set of backup recovery disks. Takes it to her office. He walks over to the coffee pot. Is sipping a cup, thinking about a career change. You know, I think all of us have been at that point. And uh, she sees he's very upset, and she says, I'll do it immediately. So she takes the first disk. She puts it on the desk. She takes a label out of the drawer. She sticks it on the desk. And then she takes the disk, 
and she shoves it in the typewriter. Crank, crank, crank. And then she starts typing. B for backup. Whack! It hits him. A! Whack! And so, right? and so now he realizes every disc he's ever given her is gone. Now, this is a very interesting uh, moment. As in the days that followed, the big question there was, was this her fault? Very, very interesting question if you think about it. She'd been given a task. She didn't know how to use the tools that she'd been given in a safe and secure way. She didn't know anything about disks. She used a typewriter, right? Her process was, if thin enough to fit in typewriter, put it in a typewriter, right? It's CMM level five. It's a repeatable process, right? It worked consistently. <laughs> There's never, never been any complaints before. You know, this was just fantastic, right? Um, but what she'd been given is she'd been given this new technology, this new thing, but no instructions on how to use it safely and securely. She didn't understand that what she did was about to ruin those disks. She didn't know. Was it her fault? I think that's a position we're putting users into today. We're making them, we're forcing them to make really interesting decisions that they're not equipped to make. We haven't educated them on the ramifications of those choices. Really interesting. Now think about what came afterwards after the five and a quarter inch disk. Does anybody remember? Go way back, the three and a half. What was the difference between those two things? If, it was hard. It had a hard shell. It still had the same floppy disk inside of it. But some amount of knowledge on how to treat that thing right was built into the product itself. You knew not to ban that thing. Dude, the plastic's going to break. It was knowledge built into the system. It was easier to use in an appropriate way than the five and a quarter inch. And I think that's a model we need to start striving for in the security space. Let's make it easier and let's make it more discoverable for people to make good choices. So, the key things, I, I hope, you know, if you reflect on this later, uh, or maybe you totally won't, and I'm so glad it's dinner time type of thing, uh, but the security and privacy really has become one of the most interesting areas, I, I truly think, in software development and tests. Because there's so many interesting security ramifications to the stuff we do. And I'll, I'll just tell you, over this past 12 months, in the security space, we've just been shaken. It's, I, I'm sure you've been following the headlines, but we've seen the rise of hacktivism in a very interesting and material way. And we've also seen the rise of at least what the industry is calling advanced persistent threats. So these are very targeted attacks by very smart groups of people on the other end. And they're exploiting these trust problems that we've had for a long time but frankly, weren't an issue on scale, and now they're becoming an issue on scale. So we need to really consider the types of choices that we're making users make today. I think that's gonna be so critical, not just today, but if you think about the data exhaust that people are creating, think about how interesting ways that might be mined in the future, and we have to also think, which really makes the space exciting, that we have an active adversary on the other end. And these guys are smart. This is not like, you know, uh, your grandma's hacker kind of thing. These are guys that are very smart and motivated. And, you know, there's this old uh, saying, which I'm sure you've heard a million times, that, you know, you don't need to be faster than the bear, you just need to be faster than the slower guy. And that, that assumes, though, that you're dealing with a hungry bear. Right? If you're dealing with a hungry bear, the algorithm's really simple. Dude, just bring a slow guy with you every time you go camping. Right? It's a simple algorithm. You can follow it. It leads to a very safe outcome. But today, we're not just dealing with hungry bears. Hungry bears are the cyber criminals of yesterday. If it's more difficult to get into you than somebody else, then they'll go after somebody else. But now we've seen the rise, especially in the last 12 months, of the angry bear. So this is somebody who will go after you personally, e either because they feel that you've done something wrong or because you have very interesting and unique capabilities that others are using. They're going after the supply chain. 
and the angry bear, they're going to run past a slow guy. They may just slash him for fun on the way, but they're going to keep going, and they're going to go after you. So it's a really interesting time, and thanks so much for taking the time to be here this afternoon. I really appreciate it, and thanks, James, for having me. And as it turns out, we have time for some questions. So uh, Bonnie has the mic. Avoid the sharks at all costs. At all, the statistics are real. Okay. Now. Is it the discount code? Thumbman discount code? No. All right. Four seven Private, three eight. Private. So thank you for a very uh, interesting and stimulating talk. There's been research in usable security for 10 years. Yep. Carnegie Mellon has an entire graduate program in it. Absolutely. You are si sitting here and telling us, make security easier to use so we'll use it. How do we do that? I don't know. <laughs> Next question. No, no, you, you, you bring up a very interesting point. So the folks at Carnegie Mellon, Lori Craner, Alessandro Aquisti is there too, who's looking at the behavioral stuff with security. I mean, there's a lot of people that have been thinking about this for a while, but the truth is it's been very difficult to make progress. And I think the reason for it is that security typically trades off against other things that we really like. So you crank up security, in some cases it cranks down performance or it cranks down functionality or it cranks down a user's ability to kind of intimate the space. I'll tell you one thing that has me sort of optimistic, and this is some research uh, that a guy I mentioned before, Marcus Jacobson, did. I think this was just about a year ago. And so his research was on friendly fraud. So imagine, you know, you've got a device like an iPad, for example, or a Google tablet or some other device, and you're passing it around to others. You're looking at a photo album. Those devices are a lot more social than they have been in the past. Typically, you wouldn't take your laptop and kind of pass it around the same way you might one of these other devices. So I think it's important to think about that socialness of the devices. So what he did is to be able to pay for something, because there was a, a kind of interesting rash of somebody taking your phone or taking your device you're auto-logged into some site that you can buy stuff, like a headless Mr. T doll, for example, from like eBay. Um, and you can like buy a buddy 10 headless Mr. T dolls by hitting a button and say one click and buy it and ship it out. But what he did was change the payment mechanism so that instead of clicking the button, you had to drag cash from a wallet into a cash register. And it's amazing, just that one change, how it reframed it to the user, how it felt different to them. And the friendly fraud cases, at least in his study, went down in an interesting way. So that kind of research gives me a lot of hope. And I really think that from a security perspective, it's about signal mapping. So my mom, you know, I, I don't, don't no, I promise this last time I'm gonna pick on mom. I, I love her so much and, you know, if we walk down a bad neighborhood in New York, we both know we're in a bad neighborhood. We see graffiti on the walls, there's gunshot holes in the side of the building, there's huge locks, you know. So we know those signals. We've natively grown up with them. These are signals that we're in a bad spot we need to get out. The problem with the internet and with technology is that most people aren't attuned to the signals of danger. And I think the better that we can do signal mapping in that way, even tying it in to something that we already know is dangerous or know is problematic, I think that's, that's an area where we can make some interesting progress. That's a very long-winded answer, or a very long-winded expansion on I don't know, but hopefully that's. Uh, hi. Uh, <clears throat> I uh, wanted to know if, um, well, I, I, I recently got a Time Warner cable in uh, New York, and my, uh, oh, yeah. Oh. yeah, and my, um, should have gone Fios, man. Oh, okay. my, my SSID was SBG6580, and my password was SBG6580DF6, and 65, SBG6580 is the model number of the access point, 
Nice. And That's good. That way we won't forget it. Yeah, yeah. Well, we, and I couldn't change it. The only way I could change it was to go to 192.168.01 and type in admin Motorola for the, pass, the default password for the, um, for the device and reset it to a secure password. Yeah. My question is, um, these companies like Time Warner Cable that are not interested in your security, they don't yep. give, you know, they, they don't care about your security. So what yeah. do you do about that? Great question. I, and I, I'm so sorry to have to bring mom back into it, but there really is, <laughs> there, there really is an interesting kind of mom tie into this. So she bought a uh, wireless router. And you know, she bought it from the store. She plugged it in. She you know, found it, and I'm walking her through it over the phone. You know, she finds it on the list of available wireless access points and clicks on it and it needs a password, right? So this was one of the ones that by default has the key on the back of it. And you know, I'm like, look, you know, I'm sure that it's around there somewhere and it was, the sticker wasn't on the back and maybe it was on the box. I don't even know where it was. And so she returned it, right? She's like, dude, I can't, I can't deal with it. And so she bought another one that by default was open as a wireless access point. And I think that speaks directly to your story, or to your, your kind of question, in that because security trades off against other things that we prize and are so visible, that folks are just pushed to make those kinds of decisions. You know, it's one thing to have it on your router. It's another very interesting thing to have it on voting machines. And it turns out that the way that most tabulators work for e-voting is very similar to your story. There's a hard-coded password, it's the same for everybody, and it's security through obscurity. You think that nobody's going to have access to that particular manual that has the systemic problem of exposing everybody's passwords, and nobody ever changes it. And it's been fascinating to even see in that context where you're dealing with critical data. I mean, that's critical infrastructure stuff that we still haven't seen a change. And the problem is that we can easily assess the usability of it. I'm sure Time Warner can easily assess the kind of support benefit to them of just telling you, well, what's your number? Oh, it's underscore DF6 at the end of it, and you're set. Right? There's a clear support benefit of it, but the user isn't pushing back on risk because that's not quantified in a very real way. So I think the way that we're going to get past that problem is have users be able to assess security in much more interesting ways, in a very different paradigm than they are today. And we're already seeing that happen at the business level. If you look at RFPs or RFIs that go out for B2B, and look how those have changed over the past five years, they wouldn't ask anything about security before. And now you're starting to get very interesting, very probing security questions. So it's happening in B2B, B2C, we just haven't seen it yet. Mom's still hidden okay because she wants to shoot that thing towards the pig. She really hates the pig. Oh, yeah, great question. Oh, or mic maybe. Or we'll, we'll move it over there next. I'm curious if you're familiar with the electronic cur currency called Bitcoin and your, and your opinion on Barry, the risk. The, and the mysterious creator that kind of. Yeah. Yeah. Satoshi. Yeah. I, I, what was the, the question, like thoughts around? Well, you know, it's, it's kind of interesting. I mean, it's, um, if you look at, at the economy it's created on the back end, you know, you got guys that are taking server clusters and just mining for coins and trying to be that, which is a very interesting sort of egalitarian way to disperse it. But from a security perspective, I think that we're going to need something like that on a go forward basis. A big problem now with electronic currency is traceability. And a lot of people don't think about that today, the traceability aspects of it. They just ignore it, meaning that they're happy to kind of use their card and somebody in the sky knows that they bought this particular product or pro because they're not, they're not thinking about it actively. But I think in the not too distant future, we're gonna have like a privacy Armageddon incident. I don't know what it is, I don't know how it's gonna look, but I know it's gonna affect some senators which is going to force 
a legislative change. And that's going to be a very, very interesting and scary period for all of us. And I really think that that's going to happen. I don't think Absalon did it, even though everybody was getting you know, crazy emails from the hotel they didn't even realize they'd ever given their email address to. But I think that we're going to see something happen in the next couple of years that's going to affect some key policymakers in Washington and force privacy to be a big issue. That, and getting back to your Bitcoin question, I think at that point, people are going to be really freaked out that there's then traceability from what they spent to the merchant and how it was used. And it's going to spawn the use of more disruptive payment technologies that can disassociate those things electronically, which I don't think we have a good, uh, a good mechanism for today. So I don't know if that at all kind of answers it. Yeah, I would use it. Yeah, I would. Um, and there's a couple reasons for it. Uh, one, just because I'm really curious about it and I think it's really neat. Uh, but the second thing is, you know, there looks like to be some really strong, if not kind of esoteric and somewhat very difficult to decipher crypto behind it. And I think that's kind of fascinating. I, I think it's just such a great project to see kind of how it's evolving and how it's disrupting the space. I think we're going to see more stuff like that too. Okay, we're, we are officially out of time. Uh, I have no um, desire to stop this, though. I'm fascinated. <laughs> I think everyone I else is, too. So let's just continue with, if, if you still have voice, can you continue with another 10 Dude, minutes? Dude, go for it. I don't want to launch a denial of food attack, though, man. No, no, people no. We're, we're to, not, we, people we tend not to remember that. that kind of stuff when you're the, yeah. Sure. So. Okay, my name is Achir, WW Task Corporation. Thank you for an amazing uh, presentation. I have a couple of questions. The first is what do you think about the future of security privacy in the internet? And the second, uh, how do you estimate the uh, current state of security privacy in the internet? Okay, um, we're doomed and bad. <laughs> One and two. No, okay. So. Um, I, so I think, think the, the first one is kind of the future of security and privacy. And I, you know, I, I'll tell you I'm very, very optimistic, and I'll tell you why. You know, every year at RSA conference, we run a competition of startups. So these are companies, you know, back of the napkin kind of stuff, and then they got some funding, and then they kind of move to a stage where they really have a product, and they compete. I don't know if anybody's ever seen Shark Tank, or there's like the, the real one, which is the British one that spawned it, but there's some guys, you know, a guy will come up that's an inventor or something, and there's some investors that just like rip that guy apart. It's really interesting television, but that's, that's sort of what we do on the security space, and fascinating companies have come out of it, and there's companies that are starting to think about security differently, which I think is so critical. I think the old legacy stuff that we've been relying on is eroding very quickly, like signature-based technologies, for example. We're in a very interesting state with signature-based technologies, right? In the past, five years ago, when all the malware was stuff you've seen before and it was just about protecting users on the desktop, those things were great and they're still important, but most of the attacks that we're seeing today that are meaningful are freshly compiled malware, like compiled three hours before they were actually sent and deployed through a phishing email or through a download link. So that's very disruptive to the current set of security technology. So I think that's one interesting path is the sort of death or the reimagining of signatures. The second is on privacy. I, I don't know what's going to happen. I think we're going to go down one of maybe three roads. One is we recalibrate as a society on what privacy means. People are so knowable now in ways that they never were before. You know, the, you mentioned the Carnegie Mellon team. Uh, I don't know if anybody saw, but there was a presentation at a conference called Black Hat earlier this year where uh, a group of students there had built an app. I think it was an iPhone app, nothing personal against Android, but I think it was an, it may have been an Android app, I can't remember. Um, but this app would let you take a photo of someone at a distance. It would then cross-reference that photo with a database of pictures and then figure out who that person was before you even interacted with them. 
That means that you were forming an opinion of that person and they bring a legacy drag of history before you even shake their hand for the first time. And that's, from a societal perspective, that's going to be really interesting to see how we recalibrate to something like that. The other thing on the privacy front is that the trust choices we've been making natively for a long time are just going to be broken in the future. Like somebody sends me an email saying, hey, dude, it's great meeting you at GTAC. Remember I said I was going to send that video. Here's the link. Okay, you know, that's kind of interesting. I, maybe I did meet you at GTAC. Maybe you did say that there was a video link. How am I going to know the difference anymore? Right? Folks know I'm in GTAC. It's online. That could be a legitimate person, an illegitimate person. And I have no reasonable data to make an assessment between the two. And how do you deal with something like that as a society? That's going to be really interesting, especially when tooling makes that process accessible for everybody. Right? right now, there's some effort associated with it. I have to like really have an ax to grind with Hugh to kind of send him this. But when the marginal cost of sending one more hyper-personalized email goes to zero, I think we're going to be in a really interesting state. So I think we're going to need to have security tooling that brings visibility to data even in an email. Like, hey, when that thing pops up, I don't just want that virus scanner run on it. I want it to highlight for me key pieces of data that are about me available online to everybody so that I can make a more reasonable choice. So I don't know if that even starts to get uh, sort of the future of, uh, of security, but I, I think that we're going to need some disruptive trust technologies now that make security a lot more visible to the user and make them make better choices. Because right now, they're making choices to share data, which is great. It's connecting people. It's bringing the world together. But it has implications that we don't fully understand yet because we haven't seen the bad guy tools get mainstreamed yet. Oh, I don't know. Okay, but that, on the that outside, like, that like I wouldn't worry about the sharks. So That was like 100 answers. So because you're such a long-winded uh, answerer, we're only going to have time for one more. And then don't leave because we're giving away free cool stuff uh, immediately after this. So one more. Bonnie, you have, have one over there? Hi. Uh, I have a quick question. Uh, approach that companies like Google and Facebook have taken has been warning users that, hey, you've, you possibly could have been hacked because someone from Nigeria logged into your Gmail, and you don't usually go to Nigeria. Um, yeah. Do you think users are capable of handling that? Um, and like some places I've seen this before, for example, credit cards, I got asked questions by the TSA on my way down here because my credit card decided my flight purchase was uh, uh, suspicious. Oh, that's so, good. Yeah, yeah, yeah no, yeah, totally. Um, there's kind of an example of where that can go wrong and maybe go too far. Like, do you think these kinds of things of letting users know when they could have possibly faced a problem that they were able to process it, but more importantly, able to figure out why they were hacked and then take steps to avoid it happening to them again? Because if you just tell them you were hacked and they still click on every link and log in to Facebook from the Apple Store, like, it's going to happen again next week. Yeah. But, no, that's, that's a great question. I'll try and give a short-winded answer to it. So um, uh, about maybe four years ago, I started a company called People Security that just does security education for enterprises. And I give that preamble because that's one of the biggest challenges we've faced, is how do you go to a development org, for example, so how do you go to developers, how do you go to testers, how do you go to architects and designers and make security relevant and then thinking about security with every incremental choice? But then how do you go to the general populace of users inside that company and first make them care, which is like a really important thing, but second, make them change after something bad has happened? And it's very interesting, at least the stuff that I've found, and this is totally anecdotal, is that one, if you show people vivid examples, then they will remember them. And I think first, that's a very interesting point to recognize. If you just tell people, don't click on stuff, it's dangerous, or look, don't access it from a kiosk, or the like Nigerian hacker guys are going to get into your Facebook account, those things don't tend to be very effective, even though they're very true. But if instead you say, hey, let me walk you through this process, so I am the hacker. I go into this space, and I do this, and I do this, and I do this. The retention rate on something like that is much, much higher. 
So for, and I'm just bringing it now to kind of the developer domain, I think that software security, for example, which is so critical, I mean, I think the pressure on software developers to make more secure software has increased dramatically over the last few years. But for a software developer, you have to make it personal. You have to show them vulnerability in their own type of code or own type of system. And you have to go all the way through from here's an interesting problem, here's how a bad guy looks at it, and now let's exploit it and do horrible things with it. And you have to show them those horrible things for them to get it on the back end. So I think it's just a vivid display of what the bad guy does to the system. So just telling somebody, hey, look, you know, we think your account was hacked, that's going to lead to them making a series of sort of even more paranoid choices that may not be appropriate. Like they won't click on the linked email anymore for phishing, but they'll always do the, hey, for security reasons, we're not including the link, and look us up on the web. It changes their behavior, but not necessarily in a good, positive way. So again, sorry, that was medium-winded. Not quite long-winded. But, but you are going to send everyone an email with a download link Absolutely. for the presentation. The presentation right? will be sent via <laughs> link. Trust me. It's good. I'll always find it. Uh, thank you, Hugh, very much.